Welcome everyone to today's digital broadcast from The Manufacturer in association with the Institute for Manufacturing at the University of Cambridge. I'm Dylan Cunningham, Conference Manager at The Manufacturer magazine, and I'm joined today by Dr. Rob Fall, Director of Research for Strategic Technology and Innovation Management in the Department of Engineering of the University of Cambridge. Rob conducts research in the area of strategic technology management, and his particular interests include technology evaluation, the emergence of technology-based industry, the use of visual techniques for strategy, and the development of practical management tools. Rob's presentation today, which you saw just a moment ago, um, is titled Strategic Planning for Digital Transformation, and it explores the concept and practice of strategic road mapping, and takes a look at how it's been used in different contexts to support long-term strategic planning. Before we hear from Rob, I want to remind listeners that this is actually the first of three digital broadcasts that the Manufacturer Magazine and the Institute of Manufacturing are running as we count down to the Smart Factory Expo in Liverpool this, this November. If you like what you hear today, make sure you join us for the remaining two webinars. Taken together, the three of these explore some of the issues that IFM will cover in a series of workshops that they are running at our Smart Factory Expo. These workshops are free to attend for all manufacturers, and they're a great reason to make your way to Smart Factory Expo, among others, on the 13th to the 14th of November in the in Exhibition Centre Liverpool. Registration is free for the Expo and for the webinars again, uh, and you can register at digital-manufacturing-week.com. Um, but that's all for November, so right now let's get cracking with this digital broadcast after a couple of housekeeping notes. If you have questions during Rob's presentation, please use the Ask a Question button on your screen. You should see it now. Um, we'll get to as many of these as possible at the end of the presentation, but ask them where, as and when they come up. After this broadcast, you will receive a copy of the recording along with our contact details for any follow-ups. Now over to you, Rob. Thanks, Dylan. Um, hello, everyone. I'll kick this off with a, a list of 12 um, challenges identified for digital transformation uh, from this recent article aimed at the Chief uh, Information Officer. Now, I'm sure many of you will recognize uh, some of those challenges. When I look across the set of 12, I see that about half or more are really generic to any strategic initiative, particularly uh, transformation uh, initiatives. And the others are a bit more specific to something that characterizes digital transformation and change, and that is the rapid pace of uh, development. And that makes uh, handling strategic initiatives uh, particularly challenging, I think, in the digital space. Now, the focus of this presentation is on a particular technique highlighted at the bottom there, road mapping, which is a general purpose uh, framework and approach for supporting strategy. Uh, you need to always customize it to context. Uh, the good news, though, is that it can support and address uh, aspects of all 12 of these challenges. Now, just to explain the uh, subtitle uh, of this presentation, Life in the Fast and Slow Lanes, inspired by the Eagles song. The point here is, uh, if you think about the uh, innovation, it is a race to the future, but it's not just one part of your innovation system that has to get there, the lead swimmer in this sort of uh, uh, picture, but all the elements have to somehow mesh together and, and cross the finish line together. And uh, th this sort of uh, uh, linking together the various parts of the innovation system is fraught with um, communication challenges, really. Uh, the, the, the systems we're dealing with are very complex, involving a lot of people. We're always thinking about the future, which is inherently uncertain. And all of these different stakeholders that somehow have to uh, mesh their, uh, their thinking and actions may have very different perspectives on the system. They may have different uh, backgrounds, different motivations, and, and certainly different language. And, and this sort of language barrier often seems to be the, the key uh, uh, issue that uh, sort of stops people achieving the kind of uh, integration they want. Now, if you're going to improve uh, on these matters, you really need to think in three dimensions. Uh, firstly, you need uh, an appropriate level of horizontal alignment. For example, if you're looking at product development, uh, you need the technical and commercial functions to uh, align around the uh, product ambitions. Uh, and also, say, across business units uh, to ensure synergy. Secondly, you need a uh, vertical integration to an appropriate level. For example, you can look at projects, uh, particular projects, but how do those um, fit together in a portfolio? Or uh, you can think of a organizational structure. You have uh, sections and business units fitting into a divisional corporate structure, and you want to make sure somehow uh, thinking flows up and down that uh, hierarchical stack. 
And finally, uh, if this innovation machine is to work, it has to mesh together and uh, deliver uh, in a synchronized way over time so that you can drive your innovation system into the future. And, and these are the sort of issues that uh, road mapping was originally developed uh, to address. Now I'm going to show you two uh, different uh, sort of schools of, of road mapping, if you like, different um, uh, areas where road mapping has emerged quite distinctly. The first here is uh, what you would typically see in an agile software development uh, program in terms of a roadmap. Now because, um, and this, this uh, template is from a, a Roman Pichler based in London, and uh, the, the definition on the right is from the scaled agile framework. And they basically, for, for agile, because it's moving so fast in software, People tend to focus on the prime integrator, which is the product release schedule and the associated features and so forth. And that works fine. But uh, software is a rather special case uh, for a number of reasons. Firstly, it is the fastest moving uh, technology. Uh, and secondly, issues, for example, of scale up and distribution are very different from the physical world. Now, the other tradition uh, comes from manufacturing, from a lean tradition. And what you can see in this uh, diagram is we've taken a broader view of the innovation system on the left, set against time again. And I picked this particular uh, sketch really to emphasize the point that um, while one can focus on the artifact, the actual process uh, is where a lot of the value lies, where the uh, roadmap and the, the structured thinking behind it can be used for supporting actions on the ground. Uh, so alignment of uh, uh, purpose and actions, uh, making decisions, and that, that's highlighted in, in the sketch. It's very easy to over-engineer the diagram sometimes and, and lose sight of what's, what it's actually being used for. Now let's look at our actual roadmap. NASA is always a good uh, place to look because they've been producing roadmaps uh, for the last 50 years or so. This set is particularly interesting and it's from a NASA document but it's actually an international initiative to explore space. Uh, a couple of interesting things. The first is that there's three of them. So this is clearly being used in an ongoing basis uh, to usefully coordinate uh, this uh, large initiative. And secondly, uh, in this roadmap is a rather unique set of uh, roadmaps produced at different levels. And this is always a uh, good practice, but uh, not that commonly seen. So at level one, it may look rather simplistic, but this is the top level message. And if you can't get this message over, then all the more detailed uh, content below uh, won't necessarily work. And so the message here, the story is very clear. We, where do we want to go on the right? Well, Mars. Where are we today? on the left, Earth. How do we get there? Well, in 2011, there were two options as shown depicted in this diagram. Now that's great for communicating to the public and perhaps Congress and so forth, but not enough obviously to implement this uh, vision. So below that uh, level uh, two is um, a more detailed map of how the various agencies around the world need to coordinate the activities to achieve the overall goal. And there are more detailed levels below this as well, which are necessary to actually implement this strategy. So this sort of a uh, layered structure really helps to hide complexity from those who don't need to see it and pro provide the appropriate uh, complexity for those who do. And all road mapping uh, really should be thought of, and strategy in general, uh, in terms of those sort of hierarchy of strategic representations. Now, if one takes a bit of a step back and, and looks at, look at many roadmaps, uh, one gets this sort of fairly general structure. So on the left-hand side, we have some representation of the innovation system, all of the elements that have to align over time to achieve the overall goal set against time. So this canvas, you can overlay any strategic narrative or, or plan or strategic process onto this canvas. It's very neutral to the, the way you solve a particular problem. And as a integrating uh, representation, it's very powerful for uh, supporting communication within this innovation system and also alignment of uh, actions and, and resource allocation. Now, behind this structure is a very generic uh, set of uh, fundamental questions shown in red on the right and below. I'll come back to those in a minute. Going back to the left, though, yeah, 
the different perspectives shown in the roadmap structure correlate very closely to different stakeholders that need to be involved. So it's really a, a social network sitting behind this structure. And the way I like to think of it now is uh, everyone in the system will hold a piece of the jigsaw puzzle, which they will know well. They may not know of all the other pieces uh, in all likelihood, and certainly only partially understand how they fit together. So you can think of road mapping, a roadmap really, as the picture on the front of the jigsaw puzzle box that helps people understand how their piece of the jigsaw puzzle fits into the bigger picture. If we go back to those um, fundamental questions shown in red on a couple of slides ago, the fundamental generic form of a roadmap structure is uh, defined by a three by three grid. Uh, with a sort of innovation uh, logic on the vertical structure representing fundamental questions of why do we need to act and what benefits do we seek from our system. The middle, the very tangible, what are we going to do uh, and, uh, and when, of course. And uh, that would relate to your product or service functionality, features, performance, uh, and so forth. Uh, and then the lower part of the roadmap by convention is addressing the question, how? And that would include technology defined broadly as know-how, but other resources and enablers. And then on the time dimension, uh, we have three fundamental questions, uh, typically starting on the right, to uh, assess, uh, determine what good looks like, uh, where do we want to go? If there's a lot of uncertainty, you may use scenario planning and other methods to define a few possible future states. Then you can go to the left and, and, and assess where you are now with respect to that future state and what the scale of the change and challenge is. And the middle of the roadmap is uh, to explore ways of bridging that gap. Now, roadmaps are, have strengths in terms of uh, communication and integration, but are pretty weak analytically. So as I'll come to uh, shortly, you'll need other tools and techniques to help address those question marks. But if you can uh, replace those question marks with uh, coherent uh, answers in all nine boxes, uh, which makes sense uh, along the layers and also vertically in the short, medium and long term, then you have yourself a coherent strategic plan. Now, how do we actually do this in practice? Uh, it's often impossible to tell from a roadmap how it was created. Of course, there are many software systems that can help and a internet search will reveal that. We've always tended to focus on the very human process, the kind of discussions and dialogue that you need to have in order to develop and then execute an effective strategy. And uh, just illustrated here with the simple use of uh, post-it notes. And uh, to illustrate uh, this process, here's a typical uh, strategic workshop. This would have taken one day, covering the entire scope of a business. In this particular case, it was to look for innovation opportunities uh, across the business. We had about 25 people in the room from all parts of the business, senior managers and also specialists in various areas. The structure is customized to suit their particular business. And that big chart at the back is really a, a, a landscape of expert opinion. So all of the knowledge in the room is now on the wall, everyone's contributed what they think are the most important things, and that's a great resource. So in that landscape, there'll be interesting landmarks, and uh, we've highlighted one here for a new innovation opportunity. We would have identified a whole bunch in the workshop, and then in smaller groups, we dive down into those to unpack them in what we call exploratory roadmaps to understand whether the opportunity is as interesting as we thought and what it might look like. At this stage, we might say it's not as interesting as we thought, so it's part of the exploration and filtering process. What comes out of the workshop are agreed actions to move forward into the next iteration. Zooming in on the center of one of these large charts, this is an opportunity uh, being identified. So uh, we have some uh, two features to point out. Uh, top right of this post-it notes are some numbers and they're basically linking up to the business drivers in the top part of the roadmap that were deemed important. So these are specific opportunities that uh, people are coming up with that uh, address those needs. The, the little sticky dots are really uh, from different business units in this case, uh, reflecting their uh, interests. And so you can see the overall interest uh, from the company, but also whether there's a difference in interest from different groups in the business.
So we just use very simple uh, techniques, uh, stationary, to help organizations uh, have the conversations that they need to have, depending on their context. Now, most of this is fairly general. Um, we've worked a lot in digital and uh, also when co well, all companies have digital aspects to their business. So I'm highlighting a few specific uh, uh, digitally relevant uh, experience I've had over the years. Uh, this example comes from the enterprise architecture world. So it was developed uh, to support an IT service company, understand how their solutions might fit in to address client uh, challenges. So they would be uh, sort of using this as part of the proposition development process to make sure that they can uh, understand what the needs are and what kind of solutions could support that and then to reflect that back to the client. These sort of things can be used uh, to co-create uh, the solutions as well. I'm not going to go through it in massive detail, but in terms of the why, what, and how structure, I've unpacked those a bit. And you can see that in the why, we're dealing with the broad macro level trends and drivers, what their customer segments are, how they're responding to those drivers and what their needs are, and also what their competitors uh, are doing as far as this company is new, and also the corporate and business unit uh, strategy. Moving down to the middle, it's a very tangible uh, solutions, what, the things people pay for. These are the propositions which hopefully will turn into solutions in different areas that they can offer um, useful uh, solutions to their clients. And finally, at the bottom, the how layer, we're covering the main areas of capability of this firm, the technical areas and others, and also all the other resources and enablers that are needed to deliver those solutions. Set against time and uh, not, uh, about four, four years, five years in this case is pretty long term for the, these kind of systems. If you go into other areas uh, like transport or energy, you'll find much longer time frames as well. That's obviously a challenge when uh, the digital components are moving so much faster. Now, if you allocate different layers to different kinds of technology, for example, a digital, you're going to find a very fast clock speed. Another layer might be the hardware on which that software sits. Other layers may be even materials technologies. And, and they have different time horizons for um, development that are orders of magnitude different. And you have to manage uh, those things. And the roadmap helps you see them so that you can manage them. Many companies, for example, in the automotive sector use platform, product platform strategies or technology platform strategies to help manage this asynchronous development. So for example, in the car industry, you might have a five to seven year product platform, which is defined by the chassis and quite typically the materials built into the chassis and the um, manufacturing techniques. And on top of that, then they can have modules which can be updated on a more regular basis, electronic modules and also software down to you know, frequent firmware downloads and so forth. Now, this example is specifically designed uh, for digital transformation, uh, part of a doctoral research uh, project uh, uh, that Ahmed Alali is running there with his contact details if you're interested. Basically, this is uh, taking agile methods and also uh, ideas from the design thinking world. And the idea is to help an organization really understand what digital transformation means for them, and then to break down what can be a very substantial uh, transformation into sub transformations. So he's using minimum viable product concepts from Agile uh, to, uh, to do this. And also the whole, he's got a, a workshop process which is uh, very compatible with uh, Agile thinking. So in these sort of situations, uh, often Agile methods are used and the, the, the software uh, parts of the business will be using these. May not be always familiar to other parts of the business. Now, these uh, workshop methods are also being uh, disrupted by digital technologies. Uh, disruption is not necessarily a bad thing, of course. Uh, it just it's just a change, and it can enable new functionality. But there's always a trade-off. You may, you may be uh, gaining something, connectivity or some uh, analysis uh, capability, but you may be losing uh, things as well. So we've started to cautiously experiment with commercial off-the-shelf off technology. Professor Maicon Oliveira here is a, on sabbatical from Brazil, was doing some experiments comparing um, one particular uh, technology of interest to many people, uh, touch screens, which are getting cheaper and cheaper on the right, compared to a traditional paper and post-it note method on the left. So we can actually get some real data on the relative performance and trade-offs associated with a change to the process. 
And we'll be continuing the strand looking at all sorts of other digital technologies that you could use potentially in these human settings. What one should really be cautious about is not losing the human dimension of these processes because the, the human parts of these systems are very important, of course. Uh, software can help, but if you are not careful, one can end up at, uh, suppressing the, the human dialogue across these uh, boundaries that's so critical for success in an organization. Now, one really neat aspect of road mapping due to its uh, integrative power is it solves a really huge problem of the proliferation of strategy frameworks and tools over the decades. And these are often developed in a rather unconnected way and, and companies struggle to combine them into a set in a, in a coherent way. And uh, this is really always necessary because every, every tool or management method has strengths and weaknesses. As mentioned before, the strengths of road mapping really focus on this communication ability and also the integration ability but it's very weak analytically many other tools and techniques are available and often they have a, a, a more focused analytical capability that relates to part of the roadmap and all tools can be related to the structure of the roadmap because it's designed to be very holistic uh, this is a, a, a toolkit prototyped with the Lego organization by um, my colleague dr. Clive Kerr and it just illustrates how uh, with road mapping as a sort of integrating knowledge hub, you can start to get an, a coherent toolkit. Uh, and that uh, really can address this uh, proliferation challenge because um, you, you, you can start to, uh, around a road map, uh, build a compact uh, toolkit that you have to always customize to purpose. Now, Road mapping is a structured visual technique. And uh, if you Google image uh, road mapping, you'll find a huge array of uh, styles, and formats, structures. The solution space is enormous. And for many years, strangely, nobody was really focusing on the visual aspects of road maps. Th th this is a photograph from a workshop where somebody was sorting through a research set we have of about 400 road maps to try to make sense of this. And uh, these are just 20 of those uh, selected. And clearly you can see many different ways you can represent strategic uh, plans. I'll just highlight one key point is some of those are very simple in format. For example, number one, and number 13. Some are much more detailed, such as 14 and two. That's just an illustration of people working at those two levels uh, that I showed you with the NASA example. The simple ones are clearly for uh, uh, sort of compelling communication and of the core plan and then the more detailed ones are needed to actually make those strategic plans happen. Now we do need some guidance on how to design compelling roadmaps because a great roadmap should have good content, uh, well organized, but it also must be visually represented in a uh, attractive way. Uh, human brain is a visual pattern uh, recognition machine and we have to work with that so we've got examples of uh, really good roadmaps in terms of content and structure but uh, poorly represented visually and they don't tend to work very well a bit more dangerous than that we've got examples of uh, roadmaps that really don't have very good content or structure but they've had a great visual uh, uh, workout from a designer and people do engage with them so you've got to think uh, from, from the ground up get good content together, organize it well, and then when you're clear about the message, uh, put a bit of design effort in it to make it a clear message and very helpful to have a simplified version as a route into the more complex uh, versions. You can't just work at the simple end though, otherwise the roadmap will be very shallow. You tend to have to go into the detail to sort out things and then you come back to the surface to create the communication roadmap. Here's an illustration of a, the output of a design process developed by Clive. On the left, here's the final design sketch from the workshop. And on the right, the finished uh, product. This is for graphene, which is a remarkable new material that will have an impact on uh, digital as well. And uh, the context of this was um, three consortia were bidding for a very large um, a European research program, Graphene flagship. It's worth a, a billion euros, the largest ever. And one consortium, uh, Clive was working with them on the, um, the material used for pre presenting the proposal in Brussels. And so 
120 page complex technical proposal was compressed down into this one image on the right. And that's been quite influential in that um, consortia winning that bid and ever since for high level communication out, outward from the consortium. Within it, they'll have a lot more detailed roadmaps to make sure that everything is working appropriately. But when they want to explain to people outside why this technology is so interesting, they would use this diagram. It was on, actually on the cover of Nanoscale magazine at the time. So if we go back to our swimming pool metaphor, um, you know, we want to win, of course, everyone wants to win. As I said before, it's not just about the one lane winning, but uh, somehow the whole team has to get across the line at the same time. Uh, this is a bit of data that can at least help uh, motivate ex exploring the technique to trying it out. The good news is that you can try it out very quickly, as with all other tools. Within a day or two, you should be able to get a sense as to whether there's utility in the tool, so the risks are low. But this uh, data is very helpful as well in terms of uh, what you might expect out of using such methods. Uh, Robert Cooper is famous for his uh, stage gate method, and he's always done surveys uh, to understand how evidence of action on the ground uh, relates to overall business success. And in 2009, um, he uh, turned his eye towards the front end of innovation, which is very strategic. And in it, he asked companies, uh, do you have any evidence of paying attention to strategy there? And uh, many ways you can do that. And there's always a strong correlation with success. But road mapping was particularly strong in terms of the relationship uh, with uh, business outcomes. Uh, you know, do you have a product roadmap? in place. And so uh, it, it sort of doubles your success rate on average, can never guarantee it. But also the numbers are quite low, so not very many companies are still using this technique. Uh, and the reason for that is that it's not included in traditional business school courses and textbooks. So awareness is, is quite low and people may be associated with any technology, for example. So the great news is it's a technique that's available, it's proven, and one can get quite quick impact uh, rapidly if one tries it out. And if it's only a day or two of time to get a feeling for the technique and how it can impact on your business, then the risks are low. So that's a whistle stop tour of uh, road mapping. Just one final slide before we take some questions. And that is um, there are many, many tools and uh, techniques that can support digital transformation initiatives. This map is a just illustrating the, the various uh, interests across uh, my organization, the Institute for Manufacturing, um, and just positioned um, in terms of this was center gravity against five broad areas or steps for digital transformation. And you can see where road mapping is positioned. I've highlighted it there uh, very clearly in the sort of identify pathways, mapping out where you want to go and where you are and so on is uh, definitely what road mapping can help with. But if you think about the sort of integration aspect that I've mentioned, uh, it can actually support the process throughout and also help to align and integrate those other methods and so on. So if any of those other things look interesting, uh, our website, you can uh, you know, locate who to talk to. So with that, I think uh, we're ready for a few questions, if there are any. Yes, fantastic. Thank you, Rob, for a very insightful presentation. Uh, we do have a few questions that came in during the presentation, but everyone, please do feel free to submit more while we go through these. So the first question is on the, the different ways of, of road mapping that, that you talked about, the touchscreen and the post-it notes, mm -hmm. uh, the idea generation. Um, what criteria did you use to evaluate that and what were the findings of that? What, what was the difference between them? Well, um, I'd, I'd, I'd just uh, be able to answer from memory. I'd have to look back at the uh, report from Micon. But uh, interestingly, he, uh, when we've seen digital technology brought into workshops, often it, it can be a bit disruptive, which is why we want to do these experiments. With the time available for these experiments, people actually found the digital solution more engaging. Um, which was good news. It, it's a very tactile approach, it's very similar to post-it notes, it's a virtual post-it note. So people are standing up, engaging with an object, and after a bit of a learning curve, and, and that's one downside, I guess, it's a, a steeper learning curve than just picking up a post-it note pad, mm -hmm. their, their productivity started to increase and, and the richness of their conversation. And of course, they had a digital um, result at the end that they could share. 
Um, so that, that was very encouraging, I think, if one can actually just get, get the experience of using uh, these techniques in a highly time pressured workshop environment. Um, so I, I was encouraged that on many dimensions we were getting something extra. The downside is I think the people have to learn how to use these things, and facilitators as well as participants. Maybe over time they'll become much more ubiquitous and the interfaces will be smoother and so on. Okay, okay, great. We have another question, uh, which is on how roadmaps can be used for managing organizational culture change. And I know one of the webinars in this series, the third one, I believe, which is on the 7th of November, will cover culture and skills. Mm -hmm. But is that something you have experience with, Rob? Not primarily. It's always occurred to me that um, these sort of processes, inclusive processes, can be a, a force for good in terms of change management, organizational culture, and so on. It's not an area areas I know very well. So in many of these sort of structures you see initially, it's kind of pushed down to the bottom, acknowledging it's there, but uh, not unpacking it in detail. I have worked with some uh, organizational development experts who, who and workforce planning and that sort of thing, and, and they do use road mapping where they take those layers, unpack them into more detail, promote them to the middle, and, and use road mapping explicitly to plan out how the, 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 the human resources will change over time. So the implications are good, but you, of course you need some expertise uh, from culture, organizational change, and mm -hmm. should be able to uh, delve into those areas. Course, Inherently in road mapping, because of the time dimension, it, it's a very good um, uh, way to see change. Yes. And, and you have to manage that, of course. Yeah, a very powerful tool. And as I said, the third webinar in this series on the 7th of November, will cover that topic in a lot more detail, the skills and culture side of digital transformation. So do tune in and join us for that. We have another question here, which is on design thinking. We've actually had a few questions on design thinking now, uh, which is getting very popular. Is, can design thinking be integrated into road mapping? <laughs> Absolutely, and to good effect. The, I don't think there's anything that can't be integrated into road mapping because it's such a general purpose, flexible framework that can be, uh, and, and when I see people with, with skills in, for example, design thinking, when they develop roadmaps and the techniques they use, you know, it really enhances the process. Uh, IDEO in, in California has been doing this for a long time. And just recently, I've seen a couple of um, research groups, one in Berkeley, a PhD, uh, the uh, uh, person there has moved to Delft and, and that's where the other person was. So I think there's a real uh, center of excellence in Delft in the Netherlands where they're very steeped in design, design thinking and they are uh, applying that to road mapping and making much more beautiful road maps, a sort of uh, customer focus uh, and inclusivity, all very positive things to see uh, in, in road mapping. I, I don't think it does any harm at all, only good. Okay, okay. And we, again, we have a few questions on this topic. So I think really there's two things to it. What types of people in your experience are the best people to contribute to a roadmap? Mm -hmm. And to follow that up then, who should be attending the road mapping workshop at, at Smart Factory Expo? Right, so uh, people attending a workshop, that's absolutely critical to the uh, output. The quality of a roadmap is totally dependent on the quality of the knowledge and information incorporated. It won't be just a workshop. You can uh, go on a, a much more broader consultation activities before and after the workshop. The, the roadmap itself can be useful for that. Uh, in terms of the people you want to consult, um, the, the structure of the roadmap is the first port of call because uh, all of those layers are deemed important and they will need good knowledge. Uh, if you can get in the, the room, that's great. If you can't, you may have to make assumptions and then go and validate that later. Mm -hmm. um, in, it, it, sometimes there's other reasons to have people in the workshop. It's good to have an external view. Somebody will challenge the status quo and so forth, or maybe people downstream that are critical for implementation. So after the structures, the first uh, checklist, uh, then you may want to think of other reasons to have people in the workshop. They're quite scalable, so it can accommodate more people. Yes. In terms of the, uh, sorry, yeah? Yeah, that's our next question actually. Is, is there an optimal size? Uh, for these workshops? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I always start with how many people do you need? And then the, the, the techniques can scale up um, to, to accommodate that. I think the largest workshops we've run are um, 60 to 80 people, really, really large orchestrated events that uh, take quite, quite a bit of management, but uh, can be done. And that, that's not normal though. I'd say for business level applications, uh, sector level, typically 15 to 30. If you're focusing on, on one particular product area, probably 
five to ten is sufficient. You always want to get a mix of the commercial and technical. That, that's pretty important to get that communication working. Okay. Okay. Uh, there seems to be so many digital opportunities and use cases. One question asks, how does road mapping facilitate focus and priority? Well, a roadmap is not a great analytical tool in itself, although the benefit of being able to see things is it shouldn't be underestimated. Uh, if people all can see the thing together, they can make a lot, get a lot of insights and so on about these sort of issues. I think in terms of uh, focus and priority, you really need to bring some other tools in as well. So we tend to use uh, a couple of others uh, with road mapping all the time. The primary one would be a, a sort of portfolio selection tool, which is specifically designed to, to uh, focus down on the most important interesting uh, processes so but that tool in, uh, is a, got weaknesses as well in terms of the time dimension and the context so the two together become a much stronger toolkit okay fantastic and we have another question in our chat box for this meeting uh, with manufacturers either rushing to do something or waiting to see what happens which happens a lot could robot be a good way to help them think strategically about their digitalization opportunities. Effectively, is this slowing down to speed up? Um, well, I don't, sometimes, I mean, being too early to the party or too late is not good. <laughs> so uh, it, timing is often the key issue. People know things are coming, but when do they need to act? Now, when, when roadmap can really help uh, in terms of it, foresight and intelligence. So if you are tracking this thing dynamically and, and, and trying to understand the dynamics, you can make a better judgment as to the window of opportunity you need to work towards. So companies do often, they, for example, electric vehicles, uh, that's been known for a long time in the industry, and they're keeping track of it. And in a roadmap, that would be learned working on the right hand side to remind people uh, and what the transition will be required so people may prepare scenarios in advance. So when the time is right, when some new signal is reached from the market, they're ready to act faster. So I think it can support all of those things um, uh, if used appropriately. Okay, okay, great. And someone has asked how often or if they should revisit and review road mapping to provide a constant of purpose and allow for flexibility and update if, if, the, if the business needs change. Yes, so this is an important thing. Um, a roadmap is always out of date as soon as you've created it. It should be <laughs> dynamic, a sort of a navigational aid. Now, the rate of change uh, of the roadmap depends on the rate of change in the business, the clock speed of the industry, the market, the technologies, and so on. So you have to uh, calibrate it to that. Um, often people also link things to their annual budget cycle or the stage gates in their product development process. Um, I... I I think there's a real danger that roadmaps get overcomplicated. Um, technical people are often <laughs> the worst culprits for that because they like the detail. Uh, but then it becomes hard to update. And also you, you, you lose the strategic benefit of really seeing clearly what the plan is. I think my preferred solution often is uh, always live, always on the wall. So if you go into some companies, they have visual management rooms where it's always work in progress. It's never looking too polished. And when, they, when an issue happens, they naturally gravitate to the chart because that's a reference point around which they can make sense of that. So for me, that's the vision is always on, always live. Companies take a while to get there, um, uh, but, but that's not necessary for everyone. If, if you're in a slow moving business, then you only look at the roadmap uh, every few years. We have a very specific question um, regarding your slide about the five steps for digital transformation. Can you provide a, a advice on good sources for that first step, which is explore? Well, there's a few little hints here, at least for um, uh, the kind of things we can help companies with, uh, examples of cases, white papers, reports, to really raise awareness of what is this thing. Because it's a, there's a hype associated with it. Co managers are worried. Um, consultants are keen on selling solutions. And so I think uh, you're pausing to think about what does it actually mean for me? In, in those 12 challenges um, that I uh, highlighted at the beginning, the second one was to have a common understanding of what digital transformation means is really important. Otherwise, you're really going to struggle. So I think, uh, you know, edu education <laughs> really about what, what is it actually, what's sitting behind the hype and what does it mean for you? I mean, some companies were digital, the digital transformation started 50 years ago. Some companies have been digital all their lives. Others uh, maybe will never be digital. Many companies, for example, in manufacturing are really focusing on um, how to improve um, sensors in their, uh, in their products, maybe moving to a service model like Rolls-Royce and GE have done for 
a long time. Uh, and it's not a total reconfiguration of the business. So all of those sort of issues, I think, are the front end thing that one has to really understand before embarking on a significant program. Okay. We have a question on different industries. For example, the airline industry. Um, do you have any separate advice that you would give to someone in that, in the highly regulated environment that they operate in? Yes, uh, actually, a aviation and, and certainly uh, aer aerospace have been road mapping one of the longest in, in the sector. So re way back to, we've seen uh, road maps from Lockheed Martin and, and NASA in the 1960s. Now, their road maps will often be long term, and the regulatory dimension, which might have its own layer, it would be absolutely critical. And so you you try to capture that there, and that will constrain the things you can do and, and define your strategy to an extent. And so I think that's always been, uh, if it's important, you should make it visible in the structure and in the process and content. And, and many roadmaps where regulation is important will do that. Pharmaceuticals would be the same. Yes, yeah. And of course, it, the the application really across different industries will, will change, but the tool itself remains valuable, I think. Yeah, it's a ge general purpose tool. You always have to configure it to context. Mm -hmm. And someone has asked about the software available to create roadmaps. Is that better? We discussed this a little bit during the lecture, but is that better than the manual roadmapping process, in your opinion? I, I would always advise to start to prototype on paper and then to work out what the method means for you as an organization how it can work and demonstrate value and then once that's done uh, which may not take a long time you'll be in a much better position to specify how software needs to support that process if one dashes to software too early it can be expensive and you might actually not get the benefits from the human process so prototype in paper and then and then decide the requirements then there are actually many many solutions appearing it's quite a volatile situation if you if you go uh, internet search you'll find dozens of mostly software service solutions um, and so the nice thing about that is you can often get a free trial for a month so if you've got a good use case you can then uh, put put those systems through their paces to understand what their capabilities are i don't think it's possible to really uh, point to any particular solution it's also quite a changeable uh, situation of course of course we have time for one or two more questions um, but any that aren't answered, we will forward on to Rob to follow up. And you will get our contact details as well if you'd like to follow up with any very particular questions. And of course, you can join us at the Smart Factory Expo during the Institute for Manufacturing's workshops to learn a bit more. So one more question, I think, is why do you think there are so many ways to interpret road mapping? Mm -hmm. Well, it's a, it's a blessing and a curse, really, the flexibility. It means you can, if you can start to learn one tool well, you can apply it everywhere. The challenge is that it needs to be customized to context and uh, and because there are so many purposes, strategic issues that you can apply to, um, that you get this massive speciation. I kind of think of it as a bit like design for X, roadmap for X. So you need to be clear what you're trying to achieve. In that Lego example, they, they experimented with road mapping for a year and then built the toolkit out and they defined uh, four different needs that they have. And actually at that point, they dropped the word roadmap and just talked about the purpose of the tool because sometimes the, the, the word road mapping can be uh, good sometimes people want to find out about it but it comes with a lot of baggage people may have seen it in a different context and may not recognize it as the same thing so i think focusing on what you're trying to achieve is is the thing and then and then for that reason you'll get a lot of different uh, types okay okay and i think this will be the very last question it's a question on knowledge bases I'm reading through this question, sorry about this. Um, so someone writes, I think that knowledge bases should also have a visual element. Uh, da, da, da. Apologies, folks. Uh, how far do you take this through to knowledge bases in terms of visual representation in the road mapping exercise? Well, I think uh, this really is an important uh, point. It's very easy to focus on the rendering, the representation, you know, that, that uh, diagram with multiple layers over time. What's sitting really behind that is a knowledge base. And we've chosen an interface which has some structure and some time dimension. With software, you can have a lot of metadata associated with events and objects as well. And you may have many cuts through that data. So I think what the road mapping is a, a sort of a, a visualization with a particular parameters of a knowledge base, uh, which might then feed into your portfolio tools and, and so on. So that is the right way to think about it. What road mapping does, which many other of these strategy tools 
rules don't rather strangely is is uh, force the time dimension to be visible and uh, many in many tools like SWOT it's an implicit dimension and also the systems thinking uh, governs the scaling of the whole toolkit always because that's really a fundamental issue of how do you structure the knowledge in, in the knowledge base okay very interesting okay as I said that will be our last question live on the webinar but that is all we have time for today thanks again Rob it's been great having you here today. Um, again, listeners, you can get your hands on these techniques at the IFM Roadmapping Workshop at Smart Factory Expo. This takes place on the 14th of November. And as I said, it is free to attend for all manufacturers, as is the Smart Factory Expo. Um, you can also talk to the IFM team at their stand, which is F47. That is Foxtrot 47. But for now, thank you, Rob, for today's presentation and discussion. And of course, thanks everyone for tuning in. Thank you.